Power by Ecotech. Hello guys, Victor here with Worldwide Corals. Uh, today we've been invited to a Harbor Ranch here in Fort Pierce, Florida. They invite us to take a tour. We're very excited. We've never been here before. They're going to show us everything that they do. So follow me inside. So I'm going to show you guys what they got going on. Uh, so this here is essentially our flagship uh, aquarium here. It's our Caribbean coral reef tank. Uh, everything in this display is local or native to uh, the Caribbean, mostly through Florida. Uh, and this is a really cool display because it's a lot of things that most people don't get to typically see unless you go out into the wild. Uh, and one of the goals with all of our display tanks here is we wanted to showcase research in some form or fashion. Uh, so a lot of our researchers study coral reefs. Um, in particular, we study uh, things like nutrient discharges on top of coral reefs. We also look at uh, the stony coral tissue loss disease. Uh, it's kind of been plaguing the entire Caribbean. And so we like to weave those things into our displays. And so some of the coolest corals uh, in this tank, in my uh, personal opinion, I'm an SPS guy, so I like uh, the Acropora cervicornis. So we have a, a little colony here, and then all along the top, we have a bunch of different colonies. I also have uh, the Elkhorn coral, so Acropora palmata. We have a colony just up top there. Another one of the really cool corals that we have in here is this one uh, just up top in the middle. Uh, it's called the Great Star Coral. It's Montastria cavernosa. It's a mounding coral. Uh, it takes a really long time to grow, uh, but it's essentially more like an LPS coral. This is 180 gallons. We set it up uh, two or three years ago now, I believe. The lighting on top, we have uh, Gen 4 radions, and we also have uh, T5s uh, running about a 65K uh, spectrum. So I like to keep it uh, a little bit more natural looking uh, for most beautiful. people. A uh, handful of different Gorgonians that are in here. And then one of the really cool uh, things that we have in here is a type of Parites coral. Uh, so it's this encrusting coral that you see all throughout the tank. Uh, and we essentially started with one little piece uh, about that big. And one day I noticed a couple little fluorescent bits uh, in the early morning. Spawning. Yep, they were doing polyp bailout. Uh, and all throughout the tank, uh, now we have ginormous colonies of this Parites coral all throughout. On the bottom we have um, protein skimming, we have a large refugium. Um, I don't use filter socks or any other filter material in this tank just because we have so many polyps. I like to keep uh, particulates in the water. Um, Thanks. Yeah, this is all Carib Sea rock. Uh, so Carib Sea is about 10 minutes from us here. They were generous enough to uh, donate all the rock and all the sand for all of our aquariums. Uh, and they told me they had this 36-inch uh, arch that they were kind of debuting. And I'm like, all right, I want to try to make that work into something. Uh, so that's a really cool thing. People like to take their picture uh, through, the, uh, through the archway there. Uh, so that's our flagship aquarium. Uh, this is the tank that we got custom built from you guys. Uh, so this is our sponge and gorgonian reef. Um, the take home point from here, it involves our biomedical research lab. So we had mentioned earlier that corals, uh, particularly soft corals and sponges, they have the ability to produce these potent compounds that we can use to treat things like cancer. Uh, and so we really wanted to display that for people, especially the sponges. Uh, most people don't even understand that a sponge is an animal and it's a living thing. Uh, and so we wanted to be able to showcase them along with some of the other soft corals that are again found mostly in our local area throughout the Caribbean. Uh, and a basket star, yeah, we just recently got that guy. Um, and fairly interesting. Um, so this tank here is again pretty low maintenance. Um, it's got carob sea rock and sand in there. We have um, a Gen 5 uh, or Gen 4 XR15 uh, up top for the lighting. We keep it a little bit later in here. We don't want to promote too much algae growth for the sponges. Uh, and then again, a, a, a protein skimmer as well as a refugium. Uh, this tank, we do like to occasionally add some of those powdered phytoplankton uh, for the sponges and for the gorgonians. Uh, so this is more of an miniature aquaculture display. So it all starts with the fish. Uh, so in this system here, we have a couple of large red drum or red fish, uh, recreationally important species. Uh, and so we do research on them, growing them to do stock enhancement, replenish uh, natural populations. Uh, and so. 
Water goes through the system after the, the fish have eaten. Uh, we have a nitrifying filter in the back. It's uh, these plastic beads, similar to uh, bio balls, uh, and it'll collect some of the waste and also break down that ammonia into nitrite and nitrate. Uh, and then the water gets pumped down. We have a sump in the back uh, that then pumps the water up into these troughs up top. And we saw some of the plants across the street. We have the same ones here. Uh, we have our salt wort, our sea purslane, these are both marsh plants, and then down at the far end we have the red mangroves. Uh, and these serve as the natural filters for the system. Uh, they will help process all of the nitrates and the phosphates. Uh, the water then flows down and we go through a couple of different uh, containers here. So we saw the sea lettuce across the street. Uh, this one is an edible macroalgae uh, for things like sea urchins, but also for people. Uh, so we're doing research to figure out uh, the nutritional value of this uh, macroalgae. Uh, we also have Gracilaria, this guy here. Uh, so this is a red macroalgae. It also has some really cool properties. Um, this is one of the producers of agar. So uh, we use that in food, we use it in ice cream, we use it to make petri dishes. Uh, so we can grow this to help produce agar. Uh, and then we also keep the variegated sea urchins in here as well. So we have uh, these guys, we grow them, um, they help eat the algae, and then also sea urchins are edible to people. Uh, so this is uni, uh, the gonads, uh, you can crack them open and you eat the, the gonads on the inside. So it's a delicacy in uh, many countries around the world. So we can grow them again for so sustainable, like sushi? Yep. Um, sustainable aquaculture. So after okay. it flows through the whole system, back down to the sump, and then it goes back over to the fish as nice clean water. So it's all recirculating and there's no discharge uh, with this system. Well, so this is how it all started. So when Ed Link started his Man in the Sea project, he basically started with the idea of putting people in an elevator and putting them down into the bottom of the ocean. So it started with this here. This is the SDC submersible decompression chamber. A diver or a, a person would go into that and they would bring them down to the bottom of the ocean. So this was from 1961. So this is pretty historic stuff here. Um, Later then he came up with the deep diver in 1966. Now this was only in use for two years and it was because they found that it rusted. And so this helped them um, to determine what metals and, and compounds to use on our actual Johnson Sea Link submersible. And so these were kind of the two like precursor brainchilds before so the-, move the... On there, like laying down? Exactly, yep. And then lower them all the way down. Mm-hmm, just to sort of test out the physiology and the constraints to putting someone under that much pressure at the bottom of the ocean. All right, so this building was originally put together so that they could build a ship and launch it right into the channel. And if you look through the back there, you can see the water and there's a big rail system that you can put ships in and out, do maintenance on them. Today we use it to uh, store a lot of our exploration and engineering equipment because you can put it right on a container and take it wherever you need to go. Hmm. Um, it's also where we keep our some of our submersibles that are part of our fleet. So the first one I want to talk about here is our Johnson Sea Link submersible. Um, it was named after our founders, Sewer Johnson and Ed Link. So I'll give you the backstory. So this was built here on our campus in 1971. So when you think about it for the 70s, it's pretty amazing. Yeah. Everything was built here with the exception of the acrylic sphere that was built out in California by some of our collaborators. And so the original design of the sub was to do something called lockout diving. So are you guys scuba divers? You know? A little bit. Okay, so you know like the, the recreational limit for diving is around 120, 130 yeah. feet. Um, so at the time that this was built, they were trying to get down to 500 to 1,000 feet. And so the way that um, Ed decided he wanted to do it was they would have two people in the front and they would stay at one atmosphere just like you're at the surface, kind of like you're going in an airplane. So you just go in normal clothes, stay closed up. Um, the aft chamber would take two scuba divers and they would do something called lockout diving. So instead of getting in the water and swimming all the way down to depth, which you're breathing compressed air, you limit your bottom time, you're basically hitching a ride in this thing as an elevator, taking you to the bottom, you pop a door open, they get out, do their dive, come back in, and then they go right into a decompression chamber. So it operated like that until the late 80s where they were doing this diving until they realized that if they converted this to a dry chamber like the front, they could actually go down deeper and stay down longer. So from like 86 on, they did no more diving out of it. They stayed completely inside and it would go down to 3,000 feet for four hours. Wow. 
And so they would take two people in the back chamber and two people in the front. One person was a pilot, so they had a full set of controls so they could bring this, the sub up to safety if they needed to. And then the second person was a scientist. And so depending on if you were the lead person in the front, you were either calling the shots and collecting all the stuff, or if you were in the back, which is what I did, um, you were taking notes and taking lots of pictures. <laughs> One of the cool things about the sub is that you basically had a 360 degree view of everything around you. And so the scientists that was in the front would collect samples. Uh -huh. And so when they first started doing the dives, they did a lot of ground truthing. So basically they go with the ship over like yeah. a pile of rocks and they say, all right, it's a reef or it's rocks. Yeah. Then they started trying to take samples from the reefs. Yeah. So we had this, this is a suction grabber, yeah. a claw grabber and a scoop. And the cool thing is each one of these um, were connected to one of these cups on this rotating carousel. Yeah. So everything you collected went in its own container. And the reason that was important is yeah. a lot of times they were collecting things that were brand new to science. So yeah. you wanted to catalog yeah. it. Um, but sometimes they cover a lot of ground. So you had to know, was it on the bottom of the reef, the top of the reef? Okay. Don't put it with another animal. It's going to eat it while you're on your yeah. dive. <laughs> so there's a whole like science that went to it. When you are the scientist in the back, you are listening to the lead scientist. And so I'll tell you the mission we were on. It's going to sound insane like I don't even think my parents believe that I did this but um, so we were looking for bioluminescence so a lot of animals create their own light often in the absence of light so it's been like a phenomenon that everyone's known about forever the lady that I was working for she was looking at whether or not animals could see color underwater because a lot of animals that live in the ocean don't see color and so we went down in the sub to 3,000 feet we turned off all the lights because since a lot of these animals don't see light you would blind them we turned on these little red lights because animals in the ocean can't see red. Yeah. So we had our own little like special flashlight. We used this suction grabber to collect these tiny little shrimp. So we were like in the dark, finding these shrimp from the reef, put them in a little black box and brought them back up to the surface. So every time they were collecting a shrimp, they would tell me like, you know, shrimp collected at this time. And I was just taking notes and listening and, um, you know, just documenting it. We brought them back up to the ship and we put them in these little chambers and we shine different wavelengths on their eyes to try to see whether or not they could see the different colors. And sure enough, the only color they saw was the exact wavelength of bioluminescence. And that was the very first time that's ever been proven in science. Wow. So it was like super cool. With like all these big wigs in science were like in our pajamas at night, like screaming. So um, <laughs> science is cool. <laughs> Wait, is that going to be in the video? No. <laughs> a lot of um, bacteria today are becoming antibiotic resistant. So creating new antibiotics is really important. So um, basically like 70% of all the medicines on the market today have natural products in them. So they come from nature. And a lot of these are discovered on land and the rainforest areas like that. Um, but we are using um, deep sea animals like these sponges and soft corals to find new therapies. And so we have a collection of over 32,000 organisms that we're screening to try to make new um, cancer treatments and antibiotics. And a lot of those came from the sub. So aside from collecting specimens, we also collect video. So on every single dive, we would take video footage and um, we just got a grant through the National Science Foundation to digitize all this footage because for years it's been on these old VHS tapes. So now we're bringing it all um, into a digital platform and it's going to be available online to researchers. So that's a really cool thing. If you're a researcher studying somewhere in Puerto Rico, you can find footage of it from the 70s and see how that reef has changed over time. Oh, what has impacted it. So it's... But it's so important because you can see, you know, for restoration, like what to bring it back to or so to manage and... Looking at something yeah. rather than hearing about it. Mm -hmm. So I want to show you these other machines here. So the submersible, that's a human occupied vehicle, right? You put people inside of it. This is a remotely operated vehicle. And so this is what we use a lot for exploration nowadays. The reason for that is it's a lot more compact, right? So instead of having to transport something with a ship, we can put this on an airplane or in a we'll truck take it somewhere exactly because people aren't inside of it. Yeah, where the depth here was 3,000 feet, there are ROVs now that go down to 19,000 feet. So we can do a lot of oh, other work. Uh, 36,000 feet is the deepest spot in the Marianas Trench. So what I like to say for exploration is we choose the right tool for the job, right? So if we need people to look at something, HOV is your way to go. If you just are taking video, an ROV is totally the way to go. So we work with ROVs right now with NOAA. They live stream footage from the bottom of the ocean with a two second delay. So when they take their ROVs down, I'll have to share the link with you guys. It's so cool. You can watch wherever they are. They could be in you know, Hawaii. And with a two second delay, you can see exactly what the ROV sees. 
So that's ROVs. Now this machine here, this is an AUV or an autonomous underwater vehicle. Now the cool thing about these is you can program them with a mission and you can send them out for months at a time without having to monitor or maintain it. A lot of these have, um, have antennas that will come up to the surface and they'll send the data back to the researchers. They'll check in, they'll say like, hey, today I'm here and this is what I found. You can put all sorts of different sensors on them. Um, I will not want to be a scuba diver and see that on the way. <laughs> yeah, everyone always asks if it's a missile. This is not a missile. <laughs> we'll see when we get there. <laughs> Which one? The chamber? chamber? Yeah, yeah. If you want to get some footage of that. So when they were first doing that lockout diving, I mean, this is a really old piece of equipment. Um, they would collect animals at depth, but they wanted to be able to look at them alive. And so they would put this, them into this pressurized container that they could bring them back up to the surface it's and the basically observe them. Exactly. So not humans. <laughs> not humans. So no, no, you, no you specimens. <laughs> so the bottom sure. of the ocean, there's a ton of pressure. Uh, like I mentioned with the styrofoam, so all the animals there are under pressure too. So if you were taking a sample and putting it into one of those chambers, as you would go up, so you know they always say when you're scuba diving, don't take a big breath underwater and then ascend because the air will rise. So that happens to these animals, if they have air in their cavities, they can expand and so it does kill a lot of them. So this was a tool that they could use to try to keep the animals alive to bring them to the surface. Um, but another thing we're doing is working on renewable energy, right? And so that's a really hot topic these days, um, trying to find sustainable green energy. And so one of our projects is trying to use ocean currents. So for years, we've used things like waves and tides to create energy, especially in areas up north where they have big tidal fluxes. Well, right now we're trying to use the Gulf Stream, which is a current that runs right off of our coast and it runs faster than any rivers, lakes, and streams on land. So it's a really amazing potential for energy. And so these are underwater turbines that our group has been building. We've been working on this project for over 10 years. In fact, we just got another $5 million appropriation. We're one of three uh, centers around the country working on renewable energy from the ocean. And so this is in um, cooperation with our campus down in Fort Lauderdale, our, our SeaTech campus. Um, but these are turbines. This is just one model. They've since um, scaled down to an even smaller model uh, that we would essentially be working with uh, power companies to deploy a field of these underwater turbines and the power of the Gulf Stream would rotate them and they could generate that into electricity and bring it back to land. I'm telling you, the reason I got out was I was like, I want to see if there's a jack here. That's amazing. Perfect. Wow, because this is where on my last tour yeah. that huge jack yeah, yeah, went yeah, yeah. by while I was talking to that guy. Yeah, I mean, they're that big. They're huge. Yeah. They, love to, they love to hang out around the seawall, and what they do is they'll like move really quick to try to isolate a single fish. Like those mullet he was trying to get, they live in big schools. Right. And so they try to like move around to spook them, and then they isolate them, and that's when it's lights out. This is our marine mammal ambulance. We have a rescue team that's on call 24-7, so if a dolphin or whale strands on the central east coast of Florida, we're their primary rescuers. So FWC will call us and we'll go out. The best case scenario is that we either disentangle the animal or help it get back into the water. Yeah. Um, you never want to take an animal into captivity if you don't have to. Okay. But if we do, we use our ambulance. Uh -huh. And so um, dolphins and whales, they're mammals like us, so they breathe air, so you don't have to put them in a tank. Um, so basically inside of that is just a foam mat and we keep it nice and cool and we stabilize the animal and we take it to a facility. And so basically National Marine Fisheries will say, there's a dolphin here, go get it and bring it to this place. And we go and do that. We also have a, a marine mammal vet who's on call and so she can help if the animal oh. you know, needs any help. The most common whale species we get, which a lot of people don't realize, um, is the sperm whale and pygmy sperm whale. So we have sperm whales off the coast of Florida. Oh, really? yeah. They buzz right close to our coast. Well, um, Gulf Stream? Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. And because it's very, very deep there. Um, they have heart problems, they have cardiomyopathies. And so a lot of times when they strand, they find that that's the cause of death. Um, and then our most common animal we do necrosties on are dolphins just because they are, you know, so common around the shore. A lot of times they're entangled on in things or swallow fishing gear. But our most famous rescue story, I'll tell you, have you guys heard of Winter the Dolphin? Yeah. Or the, the movie The Dolphin Tale? 
So contrary to what they say in the movie, Winter actually stranded in Titusville. Uh, and so she got her tail caught in a crab trap and the injury was so severe that they had to amputate her tail. And so we responded to her. Um, we have some video um, at the visitor center of little baby Winter and our team responding. And after they, they took her, they brought her over to the Clearwater Aquarium and that's where she received her prosthetic tail. So she was the first dolphin to ever receive a prosthetic tail and that's when she became famous. And of course she is the star of a dolphin tail. Uh, so we actually helped rescue Winter and Hope, who's the star of Dolphin Tail too. Uh, so our marine mammal ambulances are, are in the movies. So um, we've been working on this project for many years now, trying to grow seagrasses in captivity so we can go out and restore areas where we've seen declines. In the Indian River Lagoon, we've seen a 60% decline in seagrasses over the years. And a lot of that's due to water quality. So seagrasses, much like our grass here, they need light to grow. Um, but when the lagoon becomes cloudy from algae blooms and pollution, um, the seagrass can't get light and it dies. Now we've started doing transplants and we're starting to get even more funding to expand this. And so it's really been identifying sites in the lagoon that would be good candidates for restoration and then um, starting to pilot it to see how they do. And then we'll be monitoring it to see how they do and then going and doing even more planting based on that. But the lagoon's so big, like we mentioned, 156 miles. So there's a ton of area that needs to be restored. And we've had over a 60% decline in seagrasses over the last few years. So this is all um, ulva, which is an algae. And so this is all part of our um, integrated multi-trophic aquaculture system, which is another research project where we're growing all of these different plants and animals um, that can all be different products for the, uh, the, the seafood industry. The ulva here can be eaten by people. It can be dried and... Um, and eaten types? of the well old, this is just one species they have grown other species and we'll show you at the visitor center but this is the main one they're doing now um, it can also be used as food for animals we have a researcher who's trying really hard to get some of these things in the market yeah. and she does cooking classes with yeah. the seaweeds and same with the sea uh, vegetables so we have sea purslane there um, and so that's another one that sometimes people chop them up and put them on salads oh, they're kind of like a nice sea purslane oh, so all of these plants, they serve the role of filtration for the system that we have. So all of our tanks here are closed recirculating systems so we don't discharge any waste into the environment, which with aquaculture in a lot of places, if it's not done correctly and they discharge a bunch of waste, it can be bad for the environment. Um, but we grow all of our fish and other invertebrates inside and we send the water out here to be filtered biologically and naturally like through these plants instead of using a ton of mechanical filtration or discharging any water. This one I feel like is a little more tart. It's very cool, it's just bitter because of the salt. Yeah, yeah. So you can actually control the salinity to sort of make it saltier or, or less salty. They used to say a lot of like the native people who lived along Florida's coast, they could tell if an area was going through a drought by taking some of these marsh plants and tasting them. If they're really salty, it means there wasn't a lot of rain. If they're more mild, it could be rainy. If the salinity was lower, it would be really good. Yeah. Like really, really good. Yeah. Let me get a piece of the sea purse lane so you can try it or if you want to come over here. Do you, do you think that would be okay to go into the eye building? Yeah. Think anything? Let me let me let them taste the sea purslane and then we can go in there. Okay. Come with me. They can try a flower if they want to. Oh really? Yeah. They taste good. All right. So this is sea purslane. So of the marsh plants that we're growing, I think this one is my favorite personally. But you can compare them. Um, Tastes kind of like a salty pepper. It's a little more mild than the asparagus. Richard was actually just telling me that you can taste the flowers. So if anyone wants to try one, you can. That is actually really good. They're good. I've had them chopped up on salads before. Um, we had a researcher that used to do work on mangroves and she used to just pick them off and eat them the whole time she was in the field. So. I have some good flowers, still. Actually, the flower is better. Really? I've what? never tried a flower. Interesting. You can find these growing all along the coasts of Florida. They're, they're very abundant. They, they grow really fast. So um, great for filtering water. Tastes good. Yeah, so this is all, um, we have another. So aside from ORA, we have another company called Ziegler and they develop shrimp feed. And so they grow shrimp here and develop the, the formulas for the feeds. And so they lease out this space. So we do have a lot of commercial partners that rent out our aquaculture park. Um, so yeah, so Ziegler uses this space for shrimp. Um, and then this system, so like Richard mentioned, all part of the IMTA system, integrated multi-trophic aquaculture. Um, but of course the pompano, they're a major food fish. So they say that pompano are one of the fastest 
growing food fish that like the industry is just exploding. We have partnerships with the USDA um, to, to grow these fish and try to sustainably feed the future. Over half the seafood that we eat comes from aquaculture, so it's really important. Um, and trying to do it sustainably. Uh, and of course, just like we talked about, we develop the technology and then we pass it off to the private sector. So we do a lot of education for farmers, um, trying to teach them, you know, and, and give them the, the designs that we come up with so that they can implement it in their farms. But Pompano has been the species we've studied the longest. We've done a lot of work to adapt them to different salinities to make it easier for farmers in shore. Uh, we look at genetics, so like what strains are going to be best suited to like, you know, growing quickly without disease. Um, so there's so much that goes into it. Uh, in addition to pompano, we've also worked with red drum or redfish, which is an important uh, recreational and commercial fish. Yeah. We've done a lot of stock enhancement for those, so releasing them back into the environment to try to help, yep, the stocks. Um, we've, in the past, we've worked with cobia. Um, so lots of different marine fish, and we've got many of these hatcheries all throughout the aquaculture department where they're doing different things. Oh, we also have a, a big project with bonefish. Um, which are, or, no, the, the type of fish, but um, bonefish are a, a really important recreational species. A lot of people do fly fishing for them in the Bahamas and throughout the Caribbean, um, but their populations have declined by like 90% and they don't know why. And so they've started trying to grow them in captivity and we were the first to ever get them to spawn in captivity in the whole world. Um, happened right here on our campus. There's a really cool video yeah, of it too. Okay. So you'll have to check, check that out. All right, well guys, it's a lot more than what we expected. It's incredible everything that they do, all the aquaculture and all the submarines, all the research facility, all the wildlife that they have. I mean, it's just incredible, guys. We're so impressed with what they do. If you ever get time to come here to um, Fort Pierce in Florida, I recommend you come and take a tour of the Harbor Branch.